Hi, welcome to the video on photosynthesis. We're going to start this one off exactly the way you'd expect with a picture of a plant because plants carry out photosynthesis. They're the most conspicuous photosynthesizers on the planet, but they're not the most numerous or probably even the most important. Plants are an example of a photoautotroph, an organism that uses the energy from light to produce its own food molecules. Other major examples of photoautotrophs include things like seaweeds and algae, phytoplankton, and even cyanobacteria. The question that we're going to look at in this video is how do photoautotrophs get energy? In this video, we are going to look at an overview of photosynthesis. It's going to involve the light dependent reactions and the Calvin cycle. And then we're going to consider the evolutionary and ecological implications of photosynthesis. Let's begin with the summary equation for photosynthesis. Carbon dioxide and water produce glucose and oxygen. This is an endergonic reaction. The carbon in carbon dioxide is going to be reduced and gain electrons into glucose, and the oxygen in water is going to be oxidized, lose electrons, and form oxygen gas. There are two main parts to photosynthesis, the light-dependent reactions and the Calvin cycle. Since photosynthesis is an endergonic reaction, we need an input of free energy. That energy comes from light. Electromagnetic radiation is a source of energy, and light is a type of electromagnetic radiation. We usually think about all of electromagnetic radiation as existing on a spectrum. What we're interested in for the purpose of photosynthesis is visible light, the light that we can see with our eyes. But we're not even interested in all of the visible light. We're only interested in specific wavelengths. The molecules that capture electromagnetic radiation and use that energy to drive photosynthesis are pigment molecules. Molecules like chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. Notice that the chlorophylls do not absorb all of the wavelengths of visible light equally. In particular, wavelengths in the middle of the visible light spectrum, greenish wavelengths, are not absorbed by chlorophyll at all. This is why plants are green. Plants are green because their pigment molecules that are driving photosynthesis are absorbing red and blue wavelengths of light from the light that hits them and reflecting back out green wavelengths of light instead. The organelle in which photosynthesis occurs inside of plants and plant-like eukaryotic cells are chloroplasts. In this magnified image, you can see that these plant cells are full of chloroplasts. That's because chloroplasts are a really big deal in eukaryotic cells for being able to carry out photosynthesis. You don't need to have a chloroplast in order to carry out photosynthesis, but we're going to focus on chloroplasts because that's the site of it in any eukaryotic organism. Let's take a look at this cartoon image of a chloroplast and look at some of the features that it has. Chloroplasts have an outer membrane and an inner membrane. Inside of that inner membrane is a space referred to as the stroma. And inside of that stroma is another membranous structure known as the thylakoids. The light dependent reactions happen in the thylakoids. If we magnify a thylakoid, we can see that they're flattened stacks of membranous discs. The membrane that makes up the thylakoid is known as the thylakoid membrane and the space inside of the thylakoid is known as the thylakoid space. It's the thylakoid membrane where the light-dependent reactions occur. The Calvin cycle will occur at the stroma. Let's take a look at the light-dependent reactions. This image shows us a cartoon version of a thylakoid with the structures that are necessary for the light reactions embedded in the thylakoid membrane. You can probably already see that we're dealing with an electron transport chain, but we also have another structure that we need to pay attention to in photosynthesis, which are the photosystems. Photosystems are collections of chlorophyll and other pigment molecules that are complex with proteins. It is the purpose of these photosystems to produce high energy excited state electrons that will then be fed into an electron transport chain in another example of chemiosmosis. Chemiosmosis during the light reaction occurs at the thylakoid membrane separating the thylakoid space from the stroma. The electron transport chain sits in between two different photosystems, which are termed photosystem 2 and photosystem 1. The proton gradient is established so that there is a higher concentration of protons in the thylakoid space than there is in the stroma. When photons interact with photosystem 2, the chlorophyll in photosystem 2 produces high energy electrons that then move through the electron transport chain to photosystem 1. The free energy that's produced from the movement of these electrons is used by the members of the chain to pump protons from the stroma into the thylakoid space, maintaining the proton gradient. 
When photons of light interact with photosystem one, the chlorophylls in photosystem one will produce high energy electrons that can take one of two paths. In a non-cyclic electron flow, the electrons are used to reduce the NADP plus electron carrier into its reduced NADPH form. In cyclic electron flow, the electrons move from photosystem one back into the electron transport chain, continuing the pumping of protons. Protons cannot move through the phospholipid bilayer and have to move through ATP synthase. The energy that is released from that movement is used to drive the production of ATP. Cyclic electron flow can continue without the input of any additional molecules, but non-cyclic electron flow removes electrons from the system that have to be replaced. The molecule that serves as the source of replacement electrons for the light reaction is water. Water will be oxidized at photosystem two and produce electrons that replenish the ones that the chlorophyll in photosystem two has donated into the electron transport chain. The oxygen that's produced from the oxidation of water at photosystem two will combine with other oxygen atoms that are produced through the same process and exit the cell as waste. As long as photoautotrophs have carbon dioxide and water, they can continue to carry out the process of photosynthesis. When looking at the light dependent reactions, let's pay attention to what went in and what came out. We've put in molecules of NADP plus and we get out molecules of NADPH. We've also put in molecules of ADP and have gotten out molecules of ATP as a result. Water was also converted into oxygen, which left the cell as waste. The second step in photosynthesis is the Calvin cycle, named after Melvin Calvin, who was the scientist who elucidated the mechanisms that take place inside of the cycle. The Calvin cycle is broken up into three major phases. In the first phase of carbon fixation, carbon dioxide is brought into the cycle from the atmosphere. That carbon dioxide is combined with a molecule known as ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, also known as RUBP, and immediately undergoes a series of enzyme-controlled conversions, producing a product which has several different names. It's known as 3-phosphoglycerate, it is known as PGAL, and I generally call it G3P. The rest of the Calvin cycle is concerned with taking the molecules that are produced after carbon fixation and using the ATP and NADPH from the light reactions in order to convert those intermediary molecules back into ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, or RUBP, so that the cycle can continue. This is the Calvin cycle, and it's not something where you need to know the names of all the intermediaries or the enzymes that are involved, with one exception. We're gonna focus on the enzyme ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase, also known as Rubisco. Rubisco is the enzyme that carries out the initial step of carbon fixation, wherein a carbon dioxide is taken from the atmosphere and combined with the RUBP molecule. RUBP has five carbons and carbon dioxide has one. After the conversion that happened following this incorporation, you will produce two G3P molecules. In order to net one G3P to take out of the Calvin cycle, Rubisco has to do this three times. We often say that we need three turns of the Calvin cycle to produce one net G3P molecule. Rubisco is not only crucially important for the Calvin cycle, it's also very inefficient in how it does its job. So plants make a lot of it. By some calculations, Rubisco is the most plentiful enzyme on the planet. Looking at our accounting for the Calvin cycle, let's see what we put in and what we get out. We'll need to invest six NADPH molecules, which will be converted back to six NADP plus molecules to re-enter the light dependent reactions. We'll need to invest nine ATP molecules, which will be converted back to nine ADP molecules, which are also put back into the light dependent reactions. And we will take in three CO2 molecules, which will be used to produce one G3P molecule. G3P is a three carbon sugar precursor molecule. In order to make a glucose molecule, we'll actually need to run the Calvin cycle twice and convert those two G3Ps into one six carbon glucose molecule. Photosynthesis evolves relatively early on in the history of life on Earth, and it's only after the evolution of photosynthesis that other metabolic pathways like aerobic cellular respiration can evolve. You can't have aerobic cellular respiration if you don't have photosynthesis creating the oxygen that we breathe in from the atmosphere. For all intents and purposes, all of the oxygen that we breathe in and use to drive aerobic cellular respiration comes about as a result of photosynthesis. Not only does photosynthesis produce all of the oxygen that we need to remain alive, it's also the process by which producers produce 
all of the biological molecules that every organism on the planet consumes to produce the chemical energy that they need in order to remain alive and functional. In other words, autotrophs are what make aerobic heterotrophs possible. Thanks so much for watching our discussion of photosynthesis. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure you can explain how photosynthesis converts light into chemical energy. Make sure you can explain how each reactant and product in the photosynthesis equation is used and produced. Make sure you can explain how chemiosmosis is used in photosynthesis. And finally, make sure that you can describe the evolutionary and ecological significance of photosynthesis. If you can do each of those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks again for watching this video. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.